Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today we're talking about different approaches to law school learning with strategies for kinesthetic learners. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about being a kinesthetic learner in law school, which is unfortunately probably not the most common learning type in law school. So Lee, what is a kinesthetic learner? So a kinesthetic learner means that your brain processes material best by carrying out a physical activity, making you kind of a hands-on learner or a doer. I also like the fact that as I'm saying this, I'm like using air quotes while we're recording a (laughs) podcast, which is like the silliest thing ever. But uh, maybe that that's very kinesthetic of me to use my air quotes uh, as I'm talking. Right. And I think that makes the point, too, that nobody is 100 percent one way or the other. I mean, I know you pretty well. I probably wouldn't say that you're, you know, the world's biggest kinesthetic learner. But yeah. their techniques, or their, yes. you know, their strategies that you can use from different aspects of this, depending on what you're trying to do. And of course, even though we're podcasting air quotes, why not? Why not? I, I could just do them through this whole episode. It would be very meaningful. <laughs> Doubt it will add anything. You could spot where I'm using the air quotes. It'll be like a big secret. Um, so if you're wondering if you are a kinesthetic learner, a few ways that you can, um, a few things that you can look for. Um, maybe you find it hard to sit still for long periods of time and you've caught yourself zoning out in the classroom because you have, find it hard to focus. Um you might like to exercise. I mean, does that happen to everyone? Well, I mean, it does happen to everyone. But I think there are people who truly <laughs> have an inability to focus versus those of us who sometimes just zone out during class because it can be boring. Right. Yeah. You might find exercising more relaxing than sitting and reading a book or doing something that isn't necessarily as physical. Um, you're more likely to remember how you felt during an event than specific details about it. So you're a little more like in your body, I think, than most people um, would describe themselves as being. Um, You use hand gestures Mm -hmm. during conversations with others. um, And you would rather figure something out on your own than read or ask for directions. So you are someone who likes to grapple with um, challenges instead of having something explained to you. Now, if you're in law school, this and this sounds like you, you're probably thinking, yeah, this is not a good thing for a law student <laughs> because the law student the law school environment seems to cater more towards visual and auditory learning you're forced to sit in a classroom you listen to a bunch of lectures um maybe you make outlines and stare at them um so you might feel like your head's going to explode in some of these activities um because they're not really designed for how your brain works i think that's right i mean i think the flip side of that is that even if law school itself is not necessarily the most natural fit, I think being a lawyer, depending on the way that you decide to be a lawyer, can really be. That's true. Um, you know, so you might find in, in law school that you're doing better in classes that have some sort of practical component, such as a legal clinic, moot court, mock trial. Hey, guess what? That's basically what lawyers actually do. <laughs> so, That's true. You know, if you do feel frustrated by the classroom experience, I think it's worth taking the long view and thinking, well, you know, I'm really set on being a trial litigator. Like, I think understanding, having an intuitive understanding of how to move my body is going to be beneficial. And you're probably right about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point that a lot of you can find your place in the law school environment to match the type of person you are. And that might make you a better lawyer in the end. Who knows? Yeah, And I think if you're listening to this in your early years of law school and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm just stuck in the classroom. Well, think about ways that you can at least get a little bit of that practical experience, whether it's taking on a pro bono project where you might have to figure stuff out on your own and you actually get to interact with a person. You know, that might be something that makes the rest of it really make a lot more sense to you and make it worth putting up with, even if it's not totally natural for you. Yeah, I think that that's very true. 
The other thing to keep in mind is even if this is sounding very familiar to you, that it is important to note that your learning style may change based on the class that you're studying or um, the information that you're trying to memorize. You know, just because you are finding that you really kind of need this more physical um, mind-body connection to be able to memorize material. For some classes, it's possible that you could be more of a visual learner in torts or that um, contracts makes the most sense to you if you are doing auditory activities. So you got to keep an open mind. There's a, you know, although a lot of people talk about how important these learning styles are, we think it's more important to realize that you need to have a whole host of ideas about the different ways that you can study and you need to try them out in your classes because there's not one answer for every person for all of your law school classes. Um, You need to be able to experiment and you never know, some things might resonate with you that might surprise you. No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it's just like, you know, people who say, oh, well, I'm not a kinesthetic learner. And then they decide that they want to learn how to ski or they want to learn how to dance salsa. It's like, Mm -hmm. okay, great. Well, you can't just read about that in a book. You You can't just talk about that. Like you have to go and do it. And it's a little bit the same thing here. You might say, oh, well, you know, I'm a really kinesthetic learner. Law school is just not a great fit for me. But you can also use techniques and strategies from different types of learning styles. So we've got two other podcasts. You can listen to those. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, we're going to offer you some tips specifically catering to the kinesthetic ideas. But you might also need to pull in different approaches, you know, whether it's making flow charts or... Um, talking things out or reading your outlines and that kind of thing, you're probably to learn some of this material going to have to pull in some techniques from other types of learning styles. That's yeah. just kind of the reality of the information you're trying to learn. It is. And the only way that you really learn it resonates with you is trying different stuff out. So if you're early in your legal career or you're getting ready to start law school, it's good to think about what's worked for you in the past, but Don't close yourself off to using some of these new techniques. Try them out early in the semester so that by the time you get to exams, you have a better idea of, you know, how to study for your exam because you've been practicing these different learning techniques or trying different things out throughout the semester. So you might say like flashcards, not going to work for me. Throw this out the window. Great. Then don't waste time making flashcards at the end of the semester. But um, but you might find that some of the recommendations for even the kinesthetic learner um, learning style, which where you're discussing in this podcast, maybe some of them really resonate for you and you'd never thought about them, but you should try them out to see if they work for you. Right. And I think the key takeaway that you see in any type of study about how people learn anything and also how they learn in law school is really focusing on active learning over passive learning. Yeah. So, you know, passive learning is just kind of sitting in class, listening to a lecture, maybe reviewing your notes, and that's about it. You know, there are lots and lots of other things you could be doing to make it more hands-on and to really drill down and make this material your own and use it in a way that makes sense to you. And that's really your goal. So everything else is really a strategy. The goal is really to be an active learner. Yeah, and and a point on the passive learning as far as sitting in lectures and listening to lectures, I think that sometimes people think because you're sitting in class and you are taking notes, especially on a laptop, that you are actively engaging the material. But if you're catching yourself being a scribe or a court reporter where you're just like processing information through your brain and like not thinking about it, you're just typing it out you are probably not going to retain that information um, in any sort of important way. It's going to be much more effective for you if you close the laptop, if you are taking handwritten notes, if you are synthesizing the information as you're in class listening to it, that is more of an active approach to being engaged in class. So be careful because it's, it's an easy trap to get into where you think you're doing active activities in the classroom, but you're really just being a passive participant in what's happening in class. Right. And I think if you are a kinesthetic learner, I think taking notes by hand is probably going to be very beneficial. I mean, typically studies have suggested it's beneficial for everyone, but I think it's going to be especially beneficial for you because there's something about that act of writing things out that's more of a physical act 
which I just did cursive in the air to demonstrate writing it out. Um, <laughs> I feel but, like it you know, should be some of, sort of video podcast or something for the true, kinesthetic learner. Exactly. I don't know. Um, but, you know, rather than typing, there's just something different about it. You know, you feel the pen on the page and there's more of a connection to your brain. So I think that is definitely a strategy worth very strongly considering if you think you're a more kinesthetic learner. Um, and, you know, once you're ready to study this material, hey, hand gestures, you can totally do that. Yeah. Um, you know, so one technique sometimes people find helpful when they're trying to memorize is actually to close their eyes and use your finger to write whatever you're memorizing into the air. And you can picture the word in your mind. You can try and retrace it. You could even retrace it, say, on a whiteboard or something. But these physical acts of moving your hand, moving your finger with the words is going to help your brain memorize better. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Again... This might sound weird, but nobody's going to judge you if you get an A in your class about how you memorize the material. Right. And say that you come up with a mnemonic device, which is something that, you know, we recommend for memorizing for all different types of learning styles. But for it to really stick in your brain, you might need to really imagine writing it out or you might need to actually write it out 20 times, 30 times, 40 times so that it, you know, it becomes essentially muscle memory. Yeah. So that when you get into the exam, you can just write your entire page of mnemonics literally without thinking about them. Yep. The other thing that you can do as you study, although this is going to be different than what you can do in an exam room, is engage in a physical activity. So um, physical activities can help you memorize material. Um, and any sort of exercise has many benefits to studying. Uh, anyway, you get endorphins. It helps you sleep. Um, you are preventing hopefully getting sick and things like that. It's like good for you. But sometimes combining exercise and studying can really help a kinesthetic learner. So you can take your outline or flashcards to you at the gym and use them when you're on the treadmill or the elliptical or look up um, look up things between reps and think about them while you're doing, you know, weightlifting. Um, You know, a lot of people also have uh, found that standing desks can be very helpful Um, So I know that some people can like to stand while they study. I even have a friend who is a big proponent of standing desks. And um, she has this like swing that she swings one of her feet. I don't know if you've seen these, Allison. Um, So you're standing on one foot, but you're like swinging your other foot on this little swing. So you can, because standing in one spot isn't good for your body either. But there are these little things that you can be doing to create movement even while you're working at your desk. And it might be worth it to try some of these things out because that little bit of movement may make a big difference in how you're able to focus and learn. Right. I think sometimes, you know, something like going to the track and whether you're running or even just walking, Mm -hmm. but that type of movement can really help people memorize too, where maybe it's like, you know, different, like every other step you're alternating, whatever it is that you're trying to memorize. I mean, it sounds a little bit complicated, but I think that that degree of complicatedness is actually really what makes it stick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Also, if you are one of those people who can um, like memorize material by hearing it, if you're doing something physical, you could um, read your outline into an audio file or listen to other audio recordings or lessons Um, while you exercise or are walking on a track. Sometimes the combination of those two physical activities, the well, I guess the more physical activity of the walking and with um, the auditory material in your ear can help you um, put this material into your brain. But also little things can make a difference. Um, Some people find that using stress balls, those little things... That I'm again for the visual people. I am making a stress ball like motion with my hand. <laughs> squeeze, squeeze. I do not have a stress ball in my office, but um, but I am engaging my hand to show what the stress ball would look like. Uh, but you doing something like that with your hands um, can help you concentrate or study. Um, maybe playing with a rubber band, a paperclip, or a pen. Um, you know, even uh, using like a rock in between your fingers. Like there are lots of different things that you can do to give your body some sort of movement that can um, really just trigger your brain to allow it to absorb information in a much, a much better way. Yeah. And I think, you know, certain people find it calming. I mean, I wouldn't, 
I used to work at a summer camp once with a bunch of kids who were autistic, and they tended to have different repetitive motions that they did if they were in a stressful situation. And for whatever reason, that is a very calming thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. As you know, I have my own tick. Um, (laughs) I am obsessed with chewing ice. So if I am feeling stressed out, I literally will just chew the entire cup of ice. Yeah. I don't know if that's normal or okay (laughs) or whatever, but it, you know, whatever works. Right. So, (laughs) um, you know, chewing gum might be a better way to, to get that sensation um, of giving giving your body something to do that for whatever reason is soothing to your mind and allows you to focus. Yeah. Speaking of um, autistic children, I have to share this, and I just think this is so fascinating because it goes back to how our brains work, which is what so many of these podcast episodes are. Um, I was meeting with someone who's working on a startup to help um, autistic children start to work on noticing facial recognition. And one of the things that she did when she was a teenager is that she had a very hard time um, noticing an emotion in somebody's face. So she studied movies because she really liked music and she would listen to soundtracks and she would wait, listen to the music in the movie to help identify the emotion of the people in the scene. Hmm. And she basically created for herself in her brain almost a library of of soundtracks for like this is sad this is romantic you know this is pensive and she would try and identify somebody's face with one of these soundtracks that she basically memorized to help her label an emotion fascinating Mm -hmm. right but like kind of brilliant um and so she is working on um a startup to try and create video games around um, helping autistic children be able to use some of these techniques to learn how to identify emotion in other people's faces. But I thought it was so interesting how she took this very auditory, this very auditory thing of like a soundtrack and was able to connect that to the visual identification of looking at someone's face and trying to decide what that emotion is. And that that was one of the ways that she was able to teach herself how to identify emotions. I mean, the brain is amazing in the way it that really it can connect. It is really interesting. Isn't that fascinating? But then if you think about it, I mean, if you're thinking about someone who's a composer who's working on a movie, that's their goal. You know, they're right. trying to encourage that sort of emotional reaction. So it does make a lot of sense in a lot yeah. of ways. And in a way, probably many composers almost see the world that way, right? With mm-hmm. their own soundtracks. Um And I have friends who are musicians who um, are able to even go to a movie and play the whole soundtrack after the movie, after hearing it once. Mm. Um, And, you know, so when someone's brain works that way, it's interesting to be able to kind of harness the power of music to connect to learning something. And I think that although maybe soundtracks isn't the answer to your law school problems, (laughs) but (laughs) I do think this idea of thinking outside the box for answers to create associations that can be meaningful for you can make a lot of sense. So if music is something that's been powerful to to you, then maybe coming up with jingles or something that you can remember musically for some of this material may really be more meaningful for you. Maybe even singing that material to yourself is a great way to memorize and so not just singing singing with grand hand gestures like you're on a stage exactly yes uh like a broadway star so you know you kind of got to think outside the box and i think we oftentimes are so critical of ourselves about what works to learn material um and you know children i think who typically don't have as much of a fear of failure as us adults or a fear of judgment will do just about anything to learn how to do something Um, Right. You know, and I think we can learn a lot from that freedom to say, hey, if I'm in a room by myself, nobody's going to know how I learn this material. I just have to evaluate for myself how best I can um, make it work for me and go from there. Right. I think, you know, let yourself have some fun with it. Um, You know, one of the things you can do if you're more on the kinesthetic side of the scale is you can really channel, channel your inner actor. Yeah. So you are on the stage, you're physically acting out, maybe you're acting out a case, for example, 
um, you know, where you're playing the different parties and then that helps you really understand where each party's coming from. And you can even envision, you know, obviously you can't run around the exam room during the exam, but you can imagine <laughs> yourself physically switching sides of the plaintiff and the defendant. You know, maybe you don't just think of them as plaintiff and defendant or whoever it is in the hypo that you've been given. You might give them a face, you know, and immediately picture this person and make them three-dimensional and then mentally switch back and forth the sides of the argument. Um, you know, it's interesting, the acting thing, because, I mean, a large part of being a lawyer or whatever role you're playing as a lawyer, there again, the role, is you're really playing a role. And, yeah. You know, for example, the judge that I worked for, who when I worked for him had been on the bench 20 years and seemed like the exact personification of the judge, you know, in the courtroom, he was very judicial, always very judicial, you know, very, very, very judgy um, in a good way. But I found out <laughs> later that when he first went onto the bench, and he was quite young at the time, he was for a while the youngest sitting judge in the country, his mother was an actress. And so he would actually have her come and literally critique his performance on the bench. And they would go back and discuss it. And she would say things like, well, you know, your intonation on that certain phrase, the way that you said that made it sound not so authoritative. So you should say it like this or, oh, you know, that gesture was good. You should do it more often. And so, you know, he literally developed himself into the role of the perfect judge. Yeah. And I think that, you know, sometimes people think when you talk about developing a role or a persona around a lot of this work that it is artificial, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's just that version of yourself, that role that you're playing. I mean, I think the law specifically is unique because we get not not maybe as dressed up as, you know, like the barristers do in England and things like that. But you, <laughs> you know, you wear, I think they're a more extreme case still where they wear costumes basically to right. fill these oh, roles. I mean, so does a judge. But so does a judge. And, and you have to wear a suit to show up at, in court. You know, that is your costume. That is your role and i think most of us feel different if we are in um our dressed up work attire than if we're in our yoga clothes <laughs> you know it's part of part of getting into that persona and um i don't think there's anything wrong with that i think there's a lot of power that comes from that and it can be a little freeing because maybe you don't find um that role as it's, it doesn't make you as nervous to perform in that role because if somebody criticizes that role, they're criticizing the role, they're not criticizing you. And so I think it can also be a way to kind of protect yourself as you get more and more confident because it's really not as much about what you as your vulnerable person are doing. It's more about what you're doing on stage or in the courtroom or something that's a little bit separated from yourself. Right. And I think this is certainly an area where if you do tend to be more of a kinesthetic learner and you are more comfortable in your body, again, like I said earlier, this really can ultimately be an advantage in the legal profession. I mean, I think a lot of people who are in law school have really been taught to ignore the signals coming from their body or the signs. I mean, I remember I was in therapy because I was clinically depressed and my therapist would say, well, you know, how, do, how does this thing that you're telling me, how does that make you feel? And I literally had no idea what she was talking about. Yeah. So we had to start from kind of like first steps of like, well, I'm, I'm asking you actually what you're feeling right now. And I had no concept. And she's like, well, you know, do your hands feel sweaty? Do you feel tight in the chest? Do you feel that? And I was like, oh, wow, this is so fascinating. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> but these are things that, you know, most people who are more kinesthetically inclined probably take as a matter of course. So you may be more aware of the flashes of insight that you get from your body. There's a really fascinating Martha Beck book on this called Finding Your North Star, I think it is, mm -hmm. about how we disconnect from the intelligence of our bodies and how you can really get back to that and use that as a tool. Yeah. So I think really appreciating this, these aspects of your way of learning and your way of being in the world, even if it seems like maybe you're a bit of an outlier, I think that can be very positive. Yeah, and I think we have to recognize that these activities, these more physical activities, um, can just happen to a part of ourselves that sometimes we squelch down. When I was in my 20s, I used to do a lot of singing and performing, and um, I had a – my grandmother passed away one um, one day, and I was, I was in rehearsals for a musical, and I decided to go ahead and go to rehearsal that night – 
and I had had a really tough day. I mean, it's, you know, that's a tough day. But right. the best thing that I did for myself all of that day was actually to be with other people and sing music that was important to me because it allowed my body to process information and this reality differently. Like it was like the the music was really healing and like making music with other people specifically for me was very healing. I like making music with other people. And um and I'll never forget thinking that that was like the best way I could have ever spent that evening because I was able to kind of work through something by allowing myself to like feel my body cuz singing is very um I mean, if you're doing it right, <laughs> it's very physically <laughs> engaging um, activity and how therapeutic that was. And, and I think that we oftentimes get away from that, that there are some of these techniques and and things that we can do to create awareness in our body or work through things um, that we discredit because they don't seem to be connected to other things. Right. I think if you're a kinesthetic learner, you're probably going to need to take more time for doing things like exercise, like, you know. If you've been struggling with some complex area of the law for two or three hours, you probably need to go take a walk or jog or maybe go to a yoga class so that your brain can really start working on that. You're not just going to be able to sit in the library for 10 hours. (laughs) I mean, not that anyone really can, but even more so, you're not going to be able to do that. And I think you just can't expect yourself to do that. You need to play to your strengths. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, Okay, so going back to some of our kind of more law school related tips and techniques. So we talked about um, like using your hands when you're talking, when you're studying alone. Um, You can use your hands when you're studying in the library too. It just need to not care what other people think. Um, (laughs) Just totally fine. This is totally fine. Um, But you might find yourself either explaining a case or a subtopic to an empty chair, um, to a significant other, to your pet. Um, one of our tutors told us about this uh, this piece entitled "Keeping Kinesthetic Tactile Students on Target," which I feel like should be like say that five times fast. Yeah, but, like what? I know, but <laughs> it's a lot of K's. Uh, yeah, but apparently the article talks about uh, the difference between talking to cats versus dogs. <laughs> so um, cats tend to condescend <laughs> when they listen, um, so long as you use a voice that suggests you are like. Um, showering them with comp unless you use a voice um, that it sounds like you are showering with them with compliments um, I would say as someone who lives with cats or that I'm going to feed them or do something for them that they want <laughs> um, but the dogs listen very attentively and look at you as though you're brilliant so they make you feel smarter <laughs> um, I think my cats usually would just go to sleep if I'm like talking to them for a long period of time they're like you're boring. yeah i we had cats when i was a kid and i think they would just be like what are you going on about like oh my gosh like yeah. no like no <laughs> probably um, don't, your, your cat is probably not going to take very well to you trying to teach them but no, dog but definitely a dog but you know if you like to just have a warm body in the room the cat will probably sleep on the bed while you talk to them so that's something um but i think animals you can use animals to engage um with to kind of have somebody you can teach especially if you don't have a a person who wants to engage with you in that way um you know although i'm not a huge fan of flashcards myself i think some kinesthetic learners can find that flashcards are helpful because the physical act of writing out the cards and then flipping them over kind of engages the brain you just have to make sure that you're not falling into the pitfall of just creating busy work creating thousands of flashcards that the flashcards actually have meaning for you um, and can be something that you are using. Maybe you're reviewing them while you walk around your house or while you're at the gym. Um, Maybe you organize the flashcards in groupings so you can create, um, you know, kind of a bundle of concepts, maybe even kind of like creating an outline or a map through those concepts. You can use color coding systems or doodles or pictures to help solidify legal concepts make notes about your mnemonics or jingles or things that you're trying to memorize as well. I mean, a flashcard just doesn't have to be a word and a definition, but if that's something that has worked for you in the past, you can get creative with what those flashcards could look like. So they have a little bit more meaning than just the typical flashcard. Right. And I think the thing with flashcards, you always have to be careful about in law school is it tends for obvious reasons to be kind of a very atomic way of looking at things. 
when what you really have to do is see how all these things relate to one another. So one thing that I've heard people be successful doing is devoting, say, an entire wall in their bedroom or their office to a bunch of post-it notes, which essentially Mm -hmm. are flashcards, but you can move them around and see how they relate to each other and take a step back. And that can be a more effective way of kind of getting the same concept but not just having a stack of stuff that you're flipping over all the time. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think the other thing to keep in mind, again, is distractions. You know, while studying, you probably want to keep your desk pretty clear of distracting objects, sit in a location that's going to provide you the fewest distraction, be aware of whatever is the most distracting from you for you and try and get away. But um, we something we talked about in some of the other podcasts about learning styles as well, though, is there are some realities about distractions in the exam room that you have to be okay with. So as much as you can get very creative with your space that you're doing your study and as you get closer to exam time you have to be able to manage the distractions that are going to be in the exam room of a lot of people typing and maybe you don't have a lot of physical space to set up um you do have to sit in one spot for maybe three hours um you you know maybe you do need to explore like taking little breaks to the bathroom or walking or moving your body to make sure that you are able to engage, but you'd still have to function in the parameters of which are set forth by your school to take these exams. Right. I mean, you're not going to have time to go on a huge, you know, go cook lunch break, but you do have a couple of minutes and even a three or four hour exam to get up for two or three minutes, walk to the bathroom, splash your face with some water, take a look around, refresh, come back, sit down. Like that's well worth spending a couple of minutes, even twice or three times, you know, if you're switching between questions, that kind of thing. But again, you want to practice this. So you want to think about, do you want to take your break before you start reading a question or before you start writing? Because that can be very intimidating to come back to a white piece of paper. So, you Mm -hmm. know, you want to make sure that you've practiced in exam like conditions as much as possible and figure it out, okay, you know, this is a good use of a couple of minutes of my time. This is how I'm going to do it. So that when you go in, you feel comfortable that you have a game plan, you know what's going to work best for you and you're ready to go. Yeah. And again, if you're going to use earplugs because noise is distracting, you've got to practice with earplugs because earplugs can be distracting if you're not used to studying with them. Um, Although we talk so much about handwriting your class notes, I would not necessarily recommend handwriting an exam. I think exams should be typed when at all possible because a handwritten exam is hard for a grader or a professor to grade and you want to make their job as easy as possible. So, you know, maybe you do some handwritten study materials, but I do really think it's important to go ahead and be comfortable typing out your exam. Again, these are things you need to practice. Like yep. It's great that you can teach your cat the law, but really what comes down to is can you get down on paper what your professor is going to give you points for? And that involves practice questions early, hopefully getting some feedback, and really practicing on what you're going to be tested on so that you're not left saying, well, you know, I'm really great at moot court, but I just flunked out of law school. Right, yeah. Uh, and nobody's going to give you a job if you can't like pass any of your classes. <laughs> so. Right. So you, know, you, you kind of got to suck it up and figure out how to how to work within the system that may not feel entirely natural to you. Yeah. Another thing I think we mentioned this a little bit um, that's important as a kinesthetic learner is dividing your work and study time into shorter sessions. So trying to take breaks um, in between. So, you know, this could be 50 minutes of hard work with a 10 minute break. I think a lot of people find that's effective. Again, that's fine. But if you do have a long exam, you are likely not going to have the ability to take a 10 minute break every hour. So you need to be able to, you know, separate how you're studying with how you're practicing for the exam. Um, But, you know, frequent small breaks are great, but do like use them to move your body as a kinesthetic learner, don't just say, great, I got 10 minutes, and then you reach in your bag and you pull out your cell phone and you're reading Facebook for 10 minutes. Right, you're going to be better off like going, you know, and doing some jumping jacks or right. push-ups or whatever it is to get to, you know, to, to reset your brain, basically. Yeah. Um, and hey, you can even do some jumping jacks in your two or three minute bathroom break. No judgment. No judgment. No judgment. Um, 
And really, nobody should be spending their ten minute break reading Facebook, even though we like all do it every now and then. Yeah, it's not really a break. It's not take really a, take break. an actual break. Take an actual break. Um, that you know, it was interesting because I was just um, I was out of town a while back, and I really noticed that because I wasn't in my habits, I was looking at my phone a whole lot less, and I could tell because of my phone's battery life, which is not very good, <laughs> yeah. um, and how fast. <laughs> You'd always it tell you're like. Oh, I only got up a couple of hours ago and my phone already has 20% battery. Yeah. How did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> but I really was like, oh, my brain is so much clearer when I am not like buried in my phone all the time. Uh, it's just so, it's like we need to set up these checks for ourselves to step back so we realize like how easy it is to get sucked into the vortex of the phone. Right. And again, I think this is actually an area where being more of a kinesthetic learner really can help because you're probably going to notice faster if you are not taking breaks and not moving your body and not doing things other than just staring at a computer screen because you're just going to go nuts. Yeah, that's so true. Um, if you decide that you want to study in a group or with a buddy, um, make sure that it's somebody who's going to be okay with you taking short breaks to retain focus, That are not that's not going to encourage you to do marathon studies sessions because it's not going to work well for you. Um, you know, you can try and engage and be a leader in the discussion. So you're not just passively listening because that's going to probably cause you to tune out. Um, and you might want to even be in a study room where you could get up and like walk around in the back of the room or move your body a little bit so you can engage that part of yourself even while working in a study room. Yeah, and this is stuff that's good for everyone. I remember when we were at trial as a lawyer and, you know, super long hours, everyone's stressed out, your brain's working really hard. And this friend of mine showed up and started doing yoga, you know, midnight one night when we were all working. And it was this moment of like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And he's like, yeah, my brain's going crazy. And then we all did yoga for five minutes. And then we're all like, wow, we're so much more focused. This is great. We should all be doing this all the time. Yeah. But, you know, it took this one person coming in and being like, I literally can't function anymore. Like, without moving, I have to do something for everyone to realize it was actually good for them, too. Yeah. And and actually, I think there's some science behind inversions. Mm -hmm. of which in, in fact, the, that was part of what we did. We yeah. Did sense. As, um, to be able to kind of like it flushes your brain with fresh blood. And the other thing about yoga is you typically breathe deeply. So you're also flushing your body with oxygen and those two things can really like shift your focus i had a yoga teacher once who was like the worse my day the longer i have to do a headstand because i can flip right. my day over if i just flip myself over for long enough um to try again yeah so i think the key takeaway is there are lots of techniques that everyone could be using here that are probably going to improve your experience and possibly even help you get better grades in law school yeah all right, all right so well, should we just run through a couple other like quick things to avoid? And then I think we're almost out of time, but um, I think we, yeah, yeah, we're, but we're it, over time. So go for it. Okay. So quickly, like again, cramped spaces, not a great idea. You want to be able to move around. Um, watch out for the internet. It's bad for all of us, but I think that um, it is bad for kinesthetic learners as well. You don't want to get pulled into that. You want to be present in your body and in this material that you are studying Watch those marathon study sessions and make sure you are taking breaks. And as you get so super busy, it can be very easy to cut out things like exercise, but that's a bad idea for you. So make sure that that's part of your study schedule and your study plan. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something that you definitely need to plan around even more so than everyone else. But it's actually great for everyone who is in law school to take a break and get some movement. Yep. So think of it as an advantage. Yep. All right, now I do think we're out of time. <laughs> so. We are out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app because we'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com or you can always contact us via our website contact form at, guess what, lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Thank you.